Hi, Michael Dowd here. This is a 75-minute Q&A session with members of KCOR, an affiliate of the Club of Rome, which in 1972 published the 30 million copy bestseller Limits to Growth, revealing the self-destructive trajectory of industrial civilization. Notice both the great questions asked and the profound insights and commentary on my program in video one, The Big Picture, Beyond Hope and Fear, which ideally you should watch before this Q&A session. See the YouTube description box for a time-coded table of contents, as well as for more information on the Canadian Association for the Club of Rome, which is also included at the end of this video. Anitra? Thank you. Thank you very much for such a very cohesive and uh, terribly interesting fix on the problem. Of course, I'm with the USA Club of Rome. I'm the president. And uh, Thomas Berry was one of our favorite members. And he talked to us many, many times about the beginning of this, but I don't think he was as detailed in the acceptance of the doom part as you have filled out the blanks. I, I wanted to ask you about your solutions, but I see in the last four slides, you've given us many solutions of how to react to this thing. I did want to tell you that I started 50 years ago a group where there was no underwater restoration of the seas at all. And I began with nuclear power plant restoration after they had killed things. And there's a very large group in North America now, of thousands and thousands of people doing restoration. But obviously this is band-aids on a dying planet. On the other hand, if we could step this up in the Marshall, Marshall Plan, we could zoom ahead to do a lot of restoration of the 85% of our forests that have been killed and the 50% of our oceans that have been killed. And uh, this, in fact, is quite a pleasant way to sit out waiting for hospice to occur because you're surrounded by nature enveloped in it in fact and so i think that will be my choice in in the hospice years <laughs> so you, i Nathan. wondered about about your uh, <laughs> so i go under the water with scuba tanks and we replant corals and sea grasses and mangroves around the world Yes. So that's my hospice. Yeah, amen. Well, I deeply applaud and bow of respect and gratitude for that work. And, and I agree. Uh, I think Karen Perry just made a uh, comment in the chat that, that so there are no solutions to predicaments. Problems can potentially have solutions. Predicaments have no solutions. They only have unavoidable outcomes. And one of my closest blogger friends and colleagues is Eric Michaels, E-R-I-K, Michaels. He has a, a blog called uh, Problems, Predicaments, and Technology. And he's got tons of great stuff on exactly this. But yes, what you're doing, Anitra, is perfect. And I think that anything, as I said before, anything that we can do to promote ecological integrity, social coherence, and personal wholeness is holy, holy work, regardless of how long humans are here. Well, thank you for reviewing and making a great deal of sense, uh, negative sense, but okay, that's the way it is, uh, out, out of this entire problematique. Yes, thanks. Okay, Gary, you have your question, and Steve Pike, you are on deck. Please uh, unmute yourself and turn on your video. Well, here, it, Michael, I love your presentation and, and you know your work. So I, I kind of just hope you can kind of riff on this question. So I'll, I'll I'll read it to you and then you can just take off with it, I think. So my question is, it's three parts, but they're quick. Do you agree that ecocidal civilization is designed to commodify, consume, and destroy us along with the rest of life on Earth? Yes. 
Okay, part two, do you have thoughts about how to create alternative communities of care that restore agency to people who are aware of both ecological and civilizational collapse? Let 10,000 uh, flowers bloom. That, that question should drive, and is driving actually for many, many people all over the world, and there's going to be innumerable examples of that. Yeah. That's that's great. I mean, I I I thought that was going to come, and I appreciate the the beauty of that image of yeah. these communities of care just blossoming. Absolutely. And Paul Hawken, even though I totally disagree on the electrification of everything, I think that's absolutely the worst thing that could happen. And yet he's been <laughs> such an older brother on the path for me for so long. And he's cataloged, I forget how many, you know, organizations all around the planet that are doing holy work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Steve, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Uh, yes, go ahead and ask. Okay. And uh, Gordon in Ottawa is on deck. Um, given uh, some of what I've seen online, uh, uh, as far as AI is concerned, and it's not a question because I don't think any of us here have, have the answer as to what's happening a month or two down the road as far as AI, but that's the, you know, the hopium that I have that, you know, if, if, if AI wipes us out, great. If it says that, you know, in order to save biodiversity, we need to start shutting down and it just takes over and does it, well, <laughs> Maybe that could happen. Yeah, I don't know. You're raising a really important point, Steve, and and I appreciate that because yeah, my, you know, as I said before, I don't think AI could do anything other than speed up our demise. It can't slow, stop, or reverse it. But I do believe that it may be possible. At least I hold out some hope of possibility that AI can actually help assess the situation, and if what artificial intelligence does is gain an ecological worldview. That's why, that's why I would want to make sure that AI is programmed with Bill Reese's work and William Cadden's work and so many others who come from the ecological paradigm, because if it doesn't yes, have an yes, ecological yes, paradigm, exactly. it's completely lost. But yes, if AI could, could somehow figure out that A, we can't wipe out all humans yet because they got to preserve the nuclear places so that we don't have nuclear toxicity, you know, 400 plus nuclear meltdowns. So if they could figure out how to have as little nuclear meltdowns as possible and other geological scale toxicity and put us out of our misery at the same time, it would be a benefit to the larger body of life. Because again, I'm life-centered. I'm, you know, I spell God, G, Earth emoji, D. What I mean by that is life personified, reality personified. And so I'm God-centered, life-centered, biocentric, ecocentric. And if millions of years of good could be done by helping to extinguish this ecocidal species um, and, uh, and also preserve as, you know, have as little as few nuclear meltdowns and help as many other species pass through this bottleneck, that would be a good thing. I'm not species centric in that regard. Thank you. Gordon, you are next and um, you ask your question. And um, I think Richard uh, van der Jacht is um, on deck following that. Um, Michael, um, I'm a big fan of the uh, Mark Twain quote, quote, which is, says, it's difficult to make predictions, uh, especially about the future. Uh, and he's such a funny guy. And how can you, um, we talked about this one evening about being certain about uncertainty, where, you know, how do you respond to the, uh, I think, quite logical statement by people that just as much as some people are certain that life will go on, you are certain that it's not. And it's so my question is about is, is then that kind of certainty um, take away from agency? The last person talked about a community of care and agency. Um, and so you talk about giving hope, not hope, but living with grace and living with joy, but that infers agency and it sort of contradicts other parts of your talk which remove agency, where agency is like, I think is the thing, right? And then everything is possible with agency and nothing is possible without agency. So how do you respond to that? kind of yeah that's a great question Gordon 
Well, first of all, I want to reiterate my enthusiasm for Meg Wheatley's post-Doom conversation with Terry Patton. They spend quite a bit on exactly on this topic. There are 10,000 things that are uncertain. And I think calling us to remind ourselves that there's all this uncertainty is really good. But there are several things, at least, that are that there's no uncertainty about at all. For example, we're not uncertain that the Earth is going to continue to spin and the moon's going to go around the Earth and that it's going to go around the solar system and that the, our solar system is going to go around the Milky Way. There's certain things that it would be false humility to say that we're uncertain about that. And so that's why in this particular program, and in much of my work recently, um, I try to ground in four things that we can say with certainty, with 99% certainty. One is that ecological overshoot, not climate change, is our biggest issue. The second is that all human-centered civilizations that view progress in human-centered terms commit ecocide. There's no counterexamples in all of human history. The third is that, um, that we can still have quality of life no matter what is the case in terms of collapse um, and that we're not uniquely evil, we're not uniquely bad, that, that, that collapse is built into the DNA, you could say, or the part of the structure of human-centered civilizations. And so those things are not uncertain. They're absolutely certain. And it's also certain, I would say, that the vast majority of people are going to deny everything I've said in this program, or most of that most of us, in fact, many of you will wake up tomorrow morning and absolutely be sure that what Michael Dowd said is full of shit, because it's unacceptable emotionally. We know that from all these previous examples of collapsing civilizations. Everybody doesn't get it. Denial is common. It's widespread. It's nearly universal. It's not universal because a lot of us have gone through it. So those are things that are, you know, so I have a, if you only watch one program of mine ever again, I would encourage you, it's on the post Doom resources page, it's called 10 Inevitables. And I have a little 30 minute version, <laughs> appetizer, a 50 minute main meal, and then a two hour full buffet, like the, I tried to take basically everything I've studied in the last 10 years and compress it into one video. 10 inevitables. And I claim that these 10 things are inevitable. And one of them is most people aren't going to be able to accept and understand why we're in collapse. That hopium, every, most people are going to reach for what gives them hope. And wherever there's addicts, there will be dealers. That the IPCC, mainstream media, New York Times bestselling authors will remain legal <laughs> hopium dealers. And that's unstoppable. And so I suggest that all of us would do well to just love people exactly where they are and exactly where they're not. Don't try to convert or convince people. Just model what it's like to be in a post-doom, no-gloom space where you can look at collapse, you can look at the possibility, the real possibility of near-term human extinction, and yet you stay generous and compassionate and loving and kind. How do you do that? People will see that. It's much better than trying to convince people of this stuff. Yes, I'm agreeing with that. And I've watched all of those uh, presentations by you. And thank you very much for that. You do mention, and you've mentioned several times, this idea of we have a human-built civilization. I know it goes back to the curse of Akkad. You know, and I've read, read the poetry. And I agree, but there's a lot of people who are seeing the uh, necessity and working to build a non-human centered civilization where it's an eco-centered civilization so could one not say yes this particular version collapses fine but th th that simply means that we finally grow up as a species and have a eco-centered civilization you, you don't seem to uh you seem to infer that that is an option, you, you mentioned it, but you don't mention it as if it's a possibility. Yeah, my, thank you again uh, for that, because I'm trying to say something very, very different, which is that we don't have to try to figure out how to live sustainably. 
for the first 95% of human history, we lived more or less in a relationship with the living world, that is with the air, the water, the soil, the forests upon which we depend, in a way that allowed us to live in place without destroying the place, and allowed for a continuity of, of many, 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 many generations. And yet we still see that whenever human beings show up with a spear that can kill at a distance, most of the big mammals go out. So I'm not trying to portray indigenous peoples as being eco-saints. I am saying, though, that we don't have to figure it out. It's going back to ecological principles. And there actually even are still on the fringes ecocentric civilizations like the Kogi Indians. Just Google Kogi Indians. There's a couple of movies or documentaries made on them. So there, it is possible to do that. And the bottom line is I want to encourage you and anybody and everybody else that's coming from the same heart space that you just articulated to pursue that with as much passion and joy and integrity and commitment as possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Richard. Uh, you have the floor and Raymond, you are on deck. Thank you, Michael, for your talk. I, um, I got the impression from when you were speaking that no matter what we do, we're doomed. There's nothing we can do and it's apocalypse tomorrow um it's like the world is ending and there's really nothing we can do to change the world i'm just wondering if there isn't some way of make doing something constructive that would it at least try to change head for change for the positive i just i really hate to leave this talk with it's very very uh, to me anyway it came across as being the world is going no matter what you do well, the world, all species goes extinct, but actually I would encourage you to, when this gets up on YouTube, watch the last third of it again, because I'm not saying the opposite of what you just said. I'm saying that just because we can't save everything doesn't mean there's not a tremendous amount that we can do that's positive. Yeah. And I encourage that. I outlined about 12 different possibilities and there's many yeah, more on some of my other programs. So yeah. I would say that, yes, we have a Homo Colossus has a terminal condition known as ecological overshoot. Homo Colossus, that is where each of us in the industrial world uses 30 to 50 times the resources and exudes 30 to 50 times the waste of Homo sapiens, mm. absolutely destined for extinction. That, that, that's our terminal condition. That may or may not mean the extinction of Homo sapiens, but it's certainly a possibility. And so I say anything and everything we can do to promote ecological integrity, social coherence, personal wholeness, build ecocentric communities, there's just tons of great work. So I would not want people to get the impression that the first half of your question is accurate. That's the opposite of what I'm trying to say. I am saying that when we accept that we have a terminal condition, it's kind of like I did 14 years ago. I was diagnosed with a form of cancer. I had a diffuse large B, large a B cell lymphoma. And I had a tumor the size of my fist in my spleen. And I had a few days of freak out. But once I truly accepted that I could die in the next eight to 10 months, if the chemo didn't work, I was going to die in the next eight to 10 months. Once I truly accepted that, no fear, because I had accepted the possibility of worst case scenario. So no possibility had, a, had any power over me. So I lived fully and joyously and gratitude every day. And fortunately, I haven't lost that sense that I'm going to die soon, that we're going to die soon, whether that's two years, 10 years, or a million years from now, all species go extinct. So I encourage people to do as much good as they possibly can and do not be in doom get through doom and then hang out in post doom no gloom the benefits that karen perry talks about the actions that jordan perry talks about the heart and mindset that meg wheatley talk about ironic because i used to treat and research lymphoma for over 30 years oh anyway, gosh oh. anyway okay thank you Okay, Raymond, uh, you have the floor and uh, Peter Melton is on deck. You can unmute and turn on your video. Uh, so Michael, I, I guess my, <laughs> my reaction to what you're saying is that uh, we should think about ourselves and be happy and, uh, and, and not worry about what the consequences are for, any, for everybody else, right? And no, I, no, I, no, I, no. I think about others. Don't think about yourself, think about others. Find ways to be a contribution and a blessing to others, including other species. Well, well that's, that's not how I heard your message. But anyways, 
Uh, you know, I, I, I do a lot of advocacy for electric vehicles and I, I, I study the topic of uh, energy and all that. I've been doing that for, for years now. And I just do not understand how you could say that electrifying everything is going to make things worse. Uh, I believe it's going to allow us to actually reduce the amount of, uh, of, uh, uh, of consumption of, of matter that we have. And uh, although I understand that overshoot is uh, definitely um, the long-term problem, um, the, the, the electrification of everything will uh, slow down climate change, which is a more immediate problem uh, that I think may lead to the end of civilization if we don't do anything about it. Uh, so I don't understand why you would say that electrification of everything won't uh, won't uh, help us uh, at least get some a, a bit of a softer uh, landing, if you will, uh, than continuing on, uh, you know, producing more and more uh, carbon dioxide with our polluting vehicles, and just accelerating this uh, tendency of uh, putting CO two and other greenhouse gases in the, in the atmosphere. Yeah. Well, thank you for that, Raymond. And I, I do not expect, I mean, especially given what you're working on, I don't expect you to agree with me or find hardly anything that what I've said here helpful. My, the, the answer to the question, how can I say that, is if you take a look at the electrification of the world and map it in terms of the exponential growth of the electrification of the world over the last 100 and say 20 years, and you map that onto ecocide, like the destruction of the air, water, soil, forests, and life upon which we depend. They are perfectly parallel. And so that's where, without an ecology, if you haven't read, if people haven't read William Catton's Overshoot, that's almost like, you know, the world almost divides for me into those who have read Overshoot and they really get it, and those that haven't. Because on this issue of electrification is one of them is that people on the left, the progressives, the greens, the, 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 the activists, and I was there for many years, 12 years, I was in that place. Um, I believe that if we just could shift to renewables, so-called renewables and, and, and wind turbines, electrification, everything else. And what I didn't realize is the problem isn't how we generate electricity. So we need to do is everything we can to shift from fossil fuel ways of generating electricity to so-called renewables. The problem is electricity generation itself. And again, I don't expect you to accept that. I really don't. So, so Mike, I was just you—you you sound a lot like um, Michael Moore in his Planet of the uh, the Humans uh, comments, and a, a lot of what he was showing on in that movie was based on um, the technology we had uh, 20 or more years ago. And I think that uh, given the progress that's been made over the last little while. Uh, electrification will give us some breathing room uh, to, uh, but but it's clear we need to do other stuff, right? We need to deal with overpopulation, which is probably the biggest, uh, or over time, the biggest uh, contributor to um, to overshoot because the more population we have, and yes, you could argue the population in the West is the biggest um, the biggest uh, contributor to all this 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 uh, this stuff. But if everybody else on the planet wants to get the same uh, center of living we have, at some point the planet could only support a small amount of people with a center of living uh, that we have, right? So there there are other problems to solve over time. Uh, but my point is that we have uh, solutions that will buy us some time to solve these other problems. And um, uh, I, I have to uh, remain hopeful that we'll be able to do things that will allow us to have a, a softer landing, if you will, um, and, and not a catastrophic um, set of, of uh, famines and, and other and wars that will, um, uh, will make uh, things much more miserable for people in the future, right? Well, I deep a deep bow of respect to your heart, brother, and I just encourage you to pursue your work with passion. I'm just going to have to respectfully disagree in terms of sort of that an understanding of technology and electric electrification and that sort of thing. So um, go ahead, uh, Peter and uh, Sally Chapman, you are on deck. Please uh, turn on your video and unmute. Thank you, go Claude, ahead. and the whole team putting this together, and and Michael. Uh, Fabulous presentation. Um, it, it was brought up earlier by the Club of Rome USA gal. Sorry, I forgot your name, but um, you know about hospice. And I just put in the chat: Are we already in hospice? Which is a angle that we have used on our on our calls and in the work that we've done together. Michael, is how does that? How might that serve us to 
to sink into that if in fact we believe that's where we are. And so I guess start with that. Are we are we on hospice? How do you define whether we're in hospice or not, or what part of us is in hospice? Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Well, first of all, I just want to lift up yours and Val's climate uh, or collapse awareness or collapse acceptance alliance calls on Thursday night um, that everybody can access on the post website. I would say, of course, we're in, in, in global hospice. Certainly, if we take a look at from a non-human center perspective, most other species you're talking about, we are absolutely in the hospice phase. We're in the sixth, at least sixth, some would say seventh or eighth mass extinction. And so even beyond humans, and yes, Homo colossus is absolutely in an extinction process. And so, yes, I think that there are benefits that only become real in our lives individually and collectively in terms of communities when we accept that we truly are in a hospice situation. And I also recognize that most people find that repulsive and won't accept it. I, I think that there's just a lot more meat on that bone and I'd love you to talk another minute. What are the, as, as we sink into the possibility that our way of life is in hospice, right? That we define yes. it a little more clearly. Because to, to go to the giant extinction thing is, is too far for our minds, I think, in general. But how do we sink in? How do you recommend folks sink into the possibility that our way of life is in hospice? And how does that change the way you might live? Yes, exactly. I, I believe that's the case. I frankly don't expect normalness. Nor, you know, uh, things getting back to normal. Normal is what caused this. I, I, I live each season. Connie and I live each season as if it could be our last. Do I think it's going to be my last? Probably not. But I, I live my life as if there's at least a 20% chance that I'm in my last two years and most everybody I love. There's a probably 50% chance that I'm in my last five years and everybody I love. And there's probably a 70% chance or greater that I'm in my last seven years and everybody I love. That's just the way I live my life. It's just a useful way to live. And I frankly think that we could see an economic collapse in the coming decade. I mean, in the coming uh, uh, month or two or three. We're, we're that precarious. It's amazing to see the things that are collapsing. And if we have a serious El Nino, like this, you know, 6,000 pound gorilla sitting off the side, uh, in combination with the economic and political insanity and corruption and all the craziness and the divisiveness and the polarization, I, I treat my way of life that every week that I still get to go to the grocery store and I get to still drive a car and I get to still use a phone, I treat them as they're all going to go away. Not because I necessarily think that in the next week or month it will, but that that's an incredibly sacred way to live. I, I just don't take any part of my life for granted. So I think, yes, that's, yeah. And again, I want to come back to Meg Wheatley, Peter, I mean, uh, 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 Jordan Perry and Karen Perry, those three, their post-Doom conversations, I mean, Bill Reese's is also great. There's a lot of them that are great. But in terms of the ones that, that, correlate with what I've been talking about here, I recommend them above all the others. That's an excellent segue because I just read a comment. He had bandwidth problems today, but uh, Bill Reese had to leave the uh, the session. He probably had a good question or two in there. And uh, Peter, if you're okay, I'm gonna move on to Sally. Yeah, yeah. hi, I'm, sp I'm speaking from the UK. So it's, cool. it's good to hear you, Michael. Thank you very much. Um, my question is, and I have read the Overshoot book, um, um, and it, my question is, I've always argued against those who blame climate change and therefore Overshoot on population growth on the basis that it is the distribution of wealth and resources that is to blame. Am I wrong in this assumption? Is it the fault of population growth? Yeah, that's a great uh, question, because no, of course, it's, it's I mean, the bigger problem right now are the 20% of humanity, the so-called wealthy, who use, you know, an unbelievably large uh, portion of the Earth's material resources and energy. So it's obviously both population and consumption, but mostly consumption at this point. But it kind of is a moot point. It's like somebody, uh, I think it was uh, Raymond before said, you know, 
that population, it's like, we're going to have to do something. We're not going to have to do anything about population. Mother nature is going to take care of that one really quickly. Like in the next five years, we're going to see a considerable beginning drop in population as Ugo Bardi makes the case of the Seneca cliff. I think it's likely to be a very steep population, but I agree with you. It's, it's, it's more consumption than population. And in fact, we try to shift the blame of those of us in the so-called developed world should be called the ecocidal world <laughs> and the developing world, those aspiring to be more ecocidal. Uh, if we point at population in, in poor countries, no, Americans, I'll speak as an American, Americans consume, we are actually more populated in terms of our impact on the planet than India. William Catton has actually about five pages in Overshoot where he deals with that, exactly that. So yeah, thanks for the question, Sally. Thank you. Thank you. Peter McKinnon. Yes, hi, hi uh, all. And Michael, I'm sorry I couldn't join earlier, but I do have a I do have a question. Actually, I actually have a couple, but the last one I just posted is both a comment and a question. And uh, I'll just read it because it's posted there. Uh, in Jared Diamond, uh, as you know, in his book uh, Collapse, he stressed how societies choose to fail or succeed. I'm just wondering now, are you advocating that we as humanity have or are failing to succeed? Absolutely. I'm, I'm saying that absolutely directly. In fact, I think he's wrong on that. He was only able to cite one example of the, what we think of as choice. That's what, I, that's what I mean by critiquing the myth of the almighty we is this idea of omnipotent human agency, that civilizations can choose to succeed or fail. I just don't believe that that's the case, as much as I honor uh, you know, these great scholars, such as Jared Diamond. Thank you. OK, Bob Bates. Uh, I didn't really have a question too much, uh, Claude. I just, and I'm not making a statement. I was just uh, putting some things in the chat. Mike can't read them. so. Wouldn't make any difference. <laughs> Actually, I anyway, thought that was so. a good question uh, because you're you're trying to get at what's the difference between now and what humanity has experienced before with its boom bust cycle. Well, from 2012, I had my climate come to Jesus moment uh, in December 3rd of 2012, as I talk about in some of my other videos. But it wasn't until 2015 that I read Catton's Overshoot and really gained the ecological paradigm. And John Michael Greer is one of my favorite authors. I've read 14 of his books. I've audio recorded with his permission, nine of them. They're all available for free up on SoundCloud. In fact, I put in the chat my link to my SoundCloud playlist. So all those audios of all these audio books that I've recorded are all available there. And this is one of the places where I actually disagree with John Michael Greer because he talks about the long descent. And this is the way, in fact, he's 100% accurate that this is the way that civilizations have typically contracted over a long period of time. What's different to answer your question? Several things. One is that we are now dealing with, as Paul Beckwith regularly makes the point, we are in abrupt climate change, 10,000 years of climate change in half a human lifetime. We have already gone beyond the range of the, the full range of, of differences in terms of high and low. We're now well beyond that. And it's unstoppable that we'll get to two or three degrees Celsius. And so that's what's different. And we're now global and we have done global industrial damage. We have destroyed, I mean, every empire in the past and every civilization in the past has committed ecocide, they've done damage, but then another civilization can take over. And we've now toxified things so severely that, that it's, it, it, there's just no way that anything can be done at any scale that will slow stop or reverse the collapse and, uh, of, of the biosphere and the collapse of industrial civilization. Does that mean that all species will go extinct? No, of course not. Does that mean that all humans will go extinct? We don't know. Is it possible that 7,000 humans or 70,000 humans, 70,000 pockets of humans in little habitable outposts around the planet can exist, say, 100 years from now? Sure, that's possible. But I don't think it's likely with a four, three, four, five degree Celsius average, which is actually going to be worse. So the big difference is the speed, the scale, and the incredible toxicity uh, and, for example, how billions of us are reliant upon complex supply chains and, 
and oil and electricity. I mean, there's so many things that we're dependent upon that people who lived like during the Great Depression, people could move back to the farm. That's not the option for most of us now. So, yeah. Thanks, Bob. Uh, was it uh, Karen Perry? I think you were next to have a question. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to say um, hello and thank you so much um, to your club for hosting this event. Um, I'm just all about talking about collapse, no matter you know where, how, when. So I actually don't have a question. I've been just chatting in the chat, responding to, to folks. So, but um, yeah, uh, and I, I encourage you, if you haven't seen my benefits conversation with Michael, you know, do so because I, I heard a few takeaways that sounded like there was confusion regarding the message that it's just, oh, you know, it's just about you and curling up in your little ball and taking care of yourself. And absolutely 100%, that's not what post doom is about. Post doom is about what can we do to collapse well. And that is a challenge that I take to heart every day as I um, get up, as I, you know, work with my local community, as I do this collapse work. There is so much work we could do to collapse well if we could get off of this ridiculous false solution, we can save the sinking ship mantra. So that's that's encouraging to me. That's joyful to me. That's like, wow, we're these wise humans. So how can we do this well and make amends for the damage that's been done? And Amen. it's not about it's not about how we power everything that we do. It's that we power everything that we do. And as somebody who's been arrested, you know, protesting fossil fuels and trying to like say, no, you know, we can do this differently. And now having to realize, wow, it's not about how we power it. It's that we power it. It's it. And so that's a whole shift in understanding, but there is lots of work to do <laughs> for ourselves, for our kids, for the next generations, and for all the rest of the community of life, the non-humans. There's still lots to do. Thank Did you all see why I consider Karen one of my closest colleagues and friends? Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. Do and you? Do you have any idea how much time you think we have to do something or, or not? Anything that you're led to pursue, pursue it with passion and with integrity and joy and, and commitment. Um, we may have months, we may have years, we probably don't have decades, but, you know, uh, there's just no, I do embrace uncertainty. And there, as I said before, 10,000 things to be uncertain about, and certainly timing is one of them. Um, well, that's one of the reasons why I don't put out a date by such and such a date. This is going to happen. Who the hell knows? But what I do know is the general trajectory and what's unstoppable. And as I claim that there are 10 inevitables that are totally unstoppable in my video of 10 inevitables, but I'd say pursue everything and anything that you can with as much juice and joy and passion and integrity and commitment that you can without knowing the time frame. And uh, I think we will. I went through all the uh, comments here. I think we'll go back to hand raising. So let's go to Peter. Thank you, Claude. Uh, say, uh, Michael, I was just wondering, uh, in terms of uh, the wide range of subjects you talked about, have you looked into the planetary boundaries modeling approach that's being developed <coughs> in Scandinavia in regard to looking at these sort of systems of systems and how they interact with a lot of unknowns still? Yeah, actually, I covered some of that. If you if you once this video is up on YouTube, I encourage you to actually watch it because I did cover some of that in terms of the planetary boundaries. And okay. um, I think it's great stuff. And the most important thing to realize is that we've overshot a number of extinction yes, exactly. level planetary boundaries. Well, I, I gave a K-Core webinar on this. this <laughs> oh, okay, good. I'll go back and watch that. Yeah, thank you. I must yep. uh, sign off as well. I'd like to stay on for the conversation, but I have another meeting I have to attend. Thank right. you very Thanks, much. Thanks, Peter. Go ahead, Gary. 
Um, so once again, thank you. And I just wanted to point out one of the things, Michael, that you do, and Karen and Jordan do this too in their work so much, uh, Dr. Pauline Boss, uh, she's an 89-year-old psychotherapist who has studied ambiguous loss her whole life. And uh, I was in a seminar with her a couple of weeks ago. Just She gave an hour talk that was brilliant. And I asked her, she says, look, the most one of the most torturous things for human beings is to feel the sense of terrible grief and loss that they can't identify. And I said, is this related to eco-psychology? Because so many people feel this strange, vague anxiety and grief. And the, our culture says, no, 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 you can't name that this is important. She says, you can't name the grief. And quite often, abusive people will tell you, you're not grieving. You have no loss. There's no problem here. And she's like saying, and she said, yes, a lot of people are carrying, in her opinion, she said, yes, a lot of people are carrying a huge amount of grief and loss because we're being gaslit by the dominant culture, which says, no, we're just going to build more infrastructure. We're just going to keep doing what we're doing. And even the promise of AI, it's like it's like the fossil fuel companies years ago said there's no such thing as climate change. And then climate change is good for you. AI is the next machine that we're making. Right. So we made we made chainsaws, bulldozers. Now we have AI. So we're going to solve it all. You see what I mean? So anyway, I just want to say, I think you are addressing a key issue in our culture, which is this enormous, ambiguous loss that no one is allowed to name. Yeah, yeah so thank you, Gary. Yeah. And one of the reasons why I'm evangelistic about an ecological interpretation of history is when you understand the kind of corruption and insanity, what John Michael Greer calls the senility of the elites, in every previous collapsed civilization and empire, then when crazy, stupid, insane, evil stuff happens, I reach for the popcorn. I don't get it. It doesn't like, oh, I'm, I don't pull my hair out. It's like, yeah, of course, of course, of course. This is the way collapse typically happens. But, but I, do, I do draw a very strong distinction, as I said earlier in my program, between the kind of grief that's resentful and bitter and, and excruciating grief, and the kind of grief that I'm calling sweet grief that's generous in its interpretation. And typically that needs an ecological understanding of history to really get that one. Anitra. Yes, Anitra. Oh, she just took a call. How about Jordan Perry jumping in there? Go for it, Jordan. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna put two minutes on the clock and try to beat it. Uh, one of the things I like to say, I don't know if I like to say it, but the, so hominid homo colossus is addicted to civilization. And it's not an exact tie down, but it's pretty darn accurate. And so if you were looking at being into intervention mode, which is what I oftentimes do, and all my messaging is basically intervention driven, I sit you on the couch and say no more, and then you yell and scream and kick your feet before you go to detox for 72 hours and start to kind of get a little bit of a sense of yourself. And then you go into recovery. But when you're in recovery, you carry that addiction with you forever. You never lose it. So trying to say and trying to get our arms around this idea that we're addicted to civilization, we're the monkey with our hand in the box holding the banana, and we're going to starve to death sitting there holding that banana we can't get out. And I'm, I came to being a doomer, as almost all do, as a dreamer. I'm a work my ass off, activist, make change, do positivity, permaculture farm, fight the man, fight the fossil fuel industry, all of those things. So it's a very difficult and very meaningful road to get to where I'm at. And I hold it dear. And I thank people like Michael and my wife, Karen, and, and people who are in the collapse acceptance community, like Peter Melton, who have really worked hard to get here. And one thing I won't do is wake up every morning in hospice, have the doctor walk in, and then challenge that doctor with whether I'm dying, how my death will go, and what sort of remediation efforts we might take. The truth is that it's done. Today is about being with family, doing good things for those around you, loving the life you have. So we're not hopeless. We hope less, and we do more with intention. There's plenty of work to do. The easy way out? 
is to keep doing civilization, keep being an addict. That's always the easy way out. I love you all. Thank you for listening to me. One minute and 50 seconds. I'm out. You're awesome, man. <laughs> Very good. And I'm going to step out of my role here as moderator, and I'm going to uh, click uh, and put in the chat a um, postdoom.com slash discussions. And I've enjoyed being part mm -hmm. of the group that uh, Jordan is in. It's, it's really the, the team of Michael Dowd as he tries to clone himself to, you know, it's almost like a, a pyramid scheme of how do we make a better world? I, really, and the cloners will make the cloners. So uh, it, it's something that someone within KCOR could actually pick up the reins and be our moderator for our, our own discussions. And so Anitra. Yes, I had three things I wanted to say. First of all, having the first study I ever did on paleo temperatures in the oceans, this change in temperature could come extremely rapidly as it has in the last uh, several million years. And it's not likely to be a nice bell-shaped curve. It's likely to have a hard edge on it. The second thing I wanted to say to make the conversation a little more cohesive is the population in the developing countries is very much a question of educating the women past fourth to sixth grade and allowing them to have some chances at careers. And if anybody's interested in population, they should be spending a lot of time with, with female education in developing countries, such as African countries, which are gonna have half of their population by the year 2050, <clears throat> under 20, 20 years old. But the third thing I wanted to say is we're, we may well run out of things like oxygen, which are supplied by the plants, which are being decimated on a daily, if not yearly basis by a great many of the consumer, consumer classes, but they're also being being uh, decimated by people in great need who need food and need to destroy the forests for food. And we, we have to think about some of these bio-ecological things which are not human. We've had a big conversation now about the human species becoming extinct. I think it would be very relevant to talk about the non-human and the key species in the non-human regime being plants um, and certain plants becoming extinct because that's far more serious really except to us who think we're the top of the food chain uh, humans uh, in terms of the survival of the earth as we know it. Yeah, Anitra, thank you for that. that. That's why my wife, Connie, who, as I mentioned, is one of the leading point people in North America for assisting trees, the assisted migration of trees, because basically her, her whole stance is whether we go extinct in the near term or not, She's going to do everything possible to increase the odds of some tree species passing into the into the future. And I think plants and trees and uh, yeah. The other thing I will say is that I would encourage you to rewatch this once it's up on YouTube, because frankly, I don't put it at any more than a 5% chance that there will be any mammals larger than this that can burrow in the ground by 2050. I think most mammals most virtually all, i think all humans virtually all humans all mammals or virtually all mammals and many vertebrates are likely to go out um uh, probably 90 percent uh or, or certainly 80 90 percent i think that things are happening so much more rapidly than um than than species vertebrates and mammals can adapt and the only person who's been saying this kind of thing is guy mcpherson and he gets a lot of grief but i'll tell you what in the last set 10 years, eight years, a lot more people have, you know, who wrote him off as being crazy have said, wait a second, he's basically giving voice to what the scientific papers are. And, you know, he's possibly wrong on dates or whatever, but I, 
I think that there's a far likelier chance that there will be no humans in 2050 than, than we'll be talking about, you know, net zero or whatever. And I, yet I fully agree with you that to educate girls, to support women is the most important thing historically that can be done in terms of population. No question. Now you've made me see why I love my cave diving so that I can just go under the water into a cave and that will be my my <laughs> final hospice resting place. I love it. I love it. Ruben, Ruben good you, to see you, you brother. Jump in there? And then Samrat, uh, maybe not, he ha raised his hand, but not on the Zoom. So if there's time, should get Samrat in. Uh, Michael, go good. Good to see you. Um, Good to see you too, brother. Give my warm regards to Connie. I, we I haven't seen that. each other in years, and I'm delighted to see the way your your work is uh, evolving. I I was also present on the Iris conversation. I uh, didn't engage with you because other stuff was going on. But about um, the, the the question I've got uh, is. Uh, what do you say to uh, parents who are, are parents and grandparents who are worried particularly about uh, young people today? I don't mean six-year-olds. I, I mean uh, teenagers, and young adults, people who are have access to some of this kind of information, and who, in a sense, have a my experience of many of them is that that they are closer just in, to sense what you're saying than what in fact they're typically being told in election campaigns from the chamber of commerce from school boards even from their own parents what advice have you got from parents who are scared silly and themselves not very skilled but are worried about the mental health of their kids in these conditions? Yeah, Ruben, that's such a great question. So on the Post Doom website, there's only three or four main pages. And one of the main pages is the connect page. It's postdoom.com slash yeah. discussions. And on that page, I have two programs specifically on parenting and grandparenting in a time of collapse. And I forget what the title of the other one was. I think that both of them are sermons. But I'm living two blocks from my soon-to-be three-year-old granddaughter. She turns three in two and a half weeks. And I'm in communication with parents and grandparents. And, and my daughter... My who's 33 is totally she understands this. She's watched some of my videos. In fact, she about a year and a half ago, she said, you know, I really want to make sure that I'm up on your best thinking, dad. And if I'm going to learn this, I might as well learn it from you. Uh, so she came over here and I massaged her feet as she watched my, you know, uh, my 10 inevitables video. And, uh, you know, I don't try to again, I try to model how to have, like, for example, I have a baseball cap and also a t-shirt that has a picture of the earth and it has Tia Tawaki, the end of the world as we know it. And people invariably will sometimes say, like, what is that? Like, what do you mean? And I said, oh, that's Tia Tawaki. It's an indigenous term. It means things are spiraling down, probably going to get worse, but just find a way to be a blessing to others. You'll be fine. <laughs> I, I, we, we don't have to have a more i think the worst thing to do is to toxify youth and children especially the youngest children with all of our grief and all of our despair and all of our fear screw all that as as karen and jordan perry have experienced their kids they've got you know several kids that are you know adult young adult but they're they're collapsed native they grew up with a sense of understanding collapse. So they don't have the same grief that those of us who grew up in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s have in terms of that rise. We were born in a time of rise and now it's collapsing. They're, they're already in collapse and they understand that. So I'd say the most that we can do is encourage, I encourage young people, I say heroes, sheroes, saints and sages have always been born in times of collapse. Those who look beyond themselves and found a way to be a blessing to their community. 
And so I encourage young people to, and parents to encourage their children that way and to not, to, to get over their own grief and despair. And again, sweet grief is a great thing, but get over the, 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 the excruciating, painful, judgmental, resentful grief and come to that place, which we can get to. This is what my whole post doom, no gloom universe is about. Come to that place of it couldn't have been otherwise that we've been unsustainable for thousands of years where we are now could not have been otherwise. And accepting that is the key to living joyously and compassionately and generously, even in the midst of, of, of certain doom for all of us at some point. And yet I think we can be of tremendous service to young families and children, but the, the worst thing we can do is to give hopium solutions to our teenagers and that if we all just shift to this or shift to that, I think that's, that's going to guarantee that they're going to be worse despair down the road pretty soon and more resentful because we sold them a bill of goods. It's just not true. Samrat, you. you had your hand raised. Yeah. Hi, Michael. I've uh, seen uh, quite a lot of videos of yours and they're super inspirational. I have like a very simple question, but a part of it you've already answered here. Yeah. It's like, if you think that the world which is going to come in the future, if we are facing all the grief that you spoke about, which I personally feel as well, and it's very hard to deal with, and there's very few people to talk about, you, according to you or the way you see it, will it, like, will the world which comes after the doom part be better than what we have now or whatever that'll follow, which is worse? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't, I, I certainly wouldn't say better because better is of course, you know, what's, what's better or worse from the perspective of earthworms, what's better or worse from the perspective of, 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 you know, canaries what's better or worse from the perspective of any species. So I don't know what I do know is I'm a compost theologian. I trust that on the other side of collapse, death, destruction, there is regeneration. And that's why anything and anything, that everything we can do to be a part of the regenerative processes of life is going to be healthy, holy work. And yes, I do trust that there will be regeneration. And as with every previous mass extinction, it typically takes eight to 15 year, million years for life to fully rebound. And it could very well take longer than that if we ionize the atmosphere with, you know, a few hundred nuclear meltdowns. So that's why I'm all about hoping that AI can help us to ensure as few nuclear meltdowns as possible. That's my one hope for AI. But I do believe that, that life will rebound and eventually life will fully rebound ag again, unless we do irreversible damage with the nuclear meltdowns, but I, I don't think so. I think even if it takes 30 or 40 million years on God's time frame, again, I'm not meaning God as an otherworldly entity. God is a sacred name for reality. On reality's time frame, I think that life, it's compost theology. I think death and resurrection isn't just about one God man 2000 years ago. It's about the nature of nature at all scales. And I trust evolution. I trust ecology. I trust this process. So even if we are not a part of the future, it's okay, right? Very okay for me because okay. I think okay. that we're Great. not going to be. Yeah, yeah. thanks so much. Yeah. yeah, amazing. Thanks so much. Yeah. Right. Sometimes people say to me, "Do I believe in life after death?" My response is, "I don't believe in life after death. I know that when I die, life continues." <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Go ahead, Gary. Yes, I think another issue, Michael, that I'd love for you to address, and, and I think your work d does this, but one of the concerns I've seen, I've been talking to a lot of older people, elderly people in meetings about sustainability and so forth, um, and a lot of them resist the notion of accepting collapse because of legacy. It's like they don't want to be leaving this mess behind. Of course. Of course. And, and that's such a huge grief for elderly folks. You know, it's of just course. like, God, I thought I was doing the right thing. And now I realize it was all screwed up. <laughs> and I don't know, have you have you got any thoughts on that? Just just yeah, yeah uh, thanks. Well, I got a fun story on that. 
First of all, I need to say this. It's important to not be self-centered, including generationally self-centered, because we who are over 50, for example, or over 60 or in retirement years can very easily be swept up in our grief of legacy, sort of that, that, that sense, the, the mourning of our legacy, understandably so. But for young people, it's the death of a vision. It's the death of a possibility. It's the death of, 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 of dreams. And the death of dreams and the death of legacy are very different things. But I want to tell this fun story because we were staying where I went through cancer treatment in, on Whidbey Island in Seattle. We were, we were stationary for six months while I went through cancer treatment. And the couple that we stayed with on the mother-in-law wing of their house, they both were retired Boeing executives massively involved in Boeing. And I walked in one day into a conversation that Connie, my wife, and the two of them were having. And Connie used to work up in Alaska for the state legislature. And she basically, she she took Exxon money. And they, of course, so the three of them were all sort of commiserating that they had all been funded at, at an earlier time in their life with fossil fuel money and whatever. And I came in and I just listened for maybe a minute or two. And I said, thank God. Half of life is knowing who and what to blame, and the other half is knowing how to avoid it. And now I know who to blame. It's you all. <laughs> but the truth is that any, any of us who are over 50 are going to be feeling that. We're going to feel the loss of legacy. And that's normal, and it's natural, and it's healthy even. And yet, uh, remember that the death of dreams, the death of possibilities for younger people is even more excruciating, I suggest. Mary Hagan had her hand up. Okay, good. Go for it, Mary. Hi, Michael. And I just wanted to make more of a comment than anything. For me to deal with your whole presentation and your approach to life at this point. Um, um, I really appreciate the comments you've given about your personal life because I kept sitting here thinking, what does this guy eat for dinner? <laughs> you know, <laughs> what does he say to it? What does he do with his grandchildren? Um, and it's getting to your comment just a few minutes ago about seniors and the, the legacy issue and things like that and and it makes a big difference to know how you and your colleagues um live from day to day yeah. so because it demonstrates to us how you know some of the ideas about how we can reflect our thinking and and our caring for at least our families and our young people yeah, thank you, Mary. Thank you for that. Um, on the Post Doom website, the Connect page, which is also Claude yeah. mentioned it also, it's actually uh, the discussion page as well. I have the most pastoral and emotionally supportive. There's five videos uh, that are my most pastoral and emotionally supportive. And there's also a great conversation that Val and Peter, the two people who lead the Collapse Acceptance Alliance calls, the relationships that matter most are the people you live with, that you sleep with, that your children, that you have history with. And there's so much that we can do to improve the quality of those relationships, even in the midst of the most scary of times. And I think that's the vital, vital work to do. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. I will go to that. Great, thanks. Uh, Simon's got his hand up. Simon. Hi, how you doing, Simon? Um, I just want to thank Michael for recognizing that um, you know this chat room is full of white faces, and that um, you know I'm I'm a minority, and um, you know I grew up in a shanty town, um, and that I think recognition of you know the the history and the legacy of imperialism is important in that um, you know when we talk about population growth um, in the third world country. Um, especially when it's rising up to the, um, you know, a level of, you know, our own country, um, the resource usage is also going to grow exponentially. Um, and, you know, even though we talk about population, you know, our children are using up, you know, 10 times uh, the number of earths that, uh, you know, a, a child somewhere else uh, yes. is using. 
Um, and so I think that's that's very important that you pointed it out. Um, and to follow up on, as a question on that is, you know, how do you address people who are from these countries who haven't gotten the benefit, um, you know, of the United States or Canada um, of our wealth, um, and and tell them that they will never get to this level of, um, you know, economic stability or um, wealth or comfort? Yeah, what a great question. Um, well, I would start by saying that it's our so-called wealth, our so-called wealth and comfort. I say our, those of us in the industrialized, you know, so-called developed countries that has actually been the greatest cause of ecocide. And I think the greatest cause of mental anguish and, uh, you know, the cognitive dissonance, to use a technical term, but, but the emotional angst of knowing that our wealth is actually the main thing that's causing ecocide. And so I think that to the degree that people in the so-called developing world or the, you know, the, uh, the, the non-ecocidal, at least to some degree, A, they don't have as far to fall. The higher you climb on the tree, the further you are to fall. But also that mental and emotional and relational angst, um, hopefully they'll be spared by. But yeah, there's no, there's no question that it's an a, it, it's a emotionally excruciating thing to know, especially if you're in your 30s or 40s or 50s or 60s, and you've had this vision that one day you'll have the wealth and comfort and ease that you see Canadians or Americans having, and now that's not the case. Uh, yeah, it can be. And it's often a challenge to not go into judgmental mode. And so to the degree that people who are younger people, especially people on the margins, people who have been oppressed and, and, and discriminated against and whatever, um, to the degree that, that those folks can maintain a generous heart is almost supernatural. It's, I mean, it's, it's really not easy. Um, and yet their own peace of mind and heart in the face of collapse uh, is largely dependent, I think, on having that generosity rather than the resentment of we didn't get ours. Just to give you one example, I just spoke two weeks or uh, about a month and a half ago at uh, in a community that is the most further along collapsed community in North America, which is the Southern Louisiana. More hurricanes hit there. Southern Louisiana is quickly being lost to the ocean collapse. John Michael Greer wrote a book called Collapse Now and Avoid the Rush. And my gosh, are they doing it down there? And this this uh, Native American, well, he's part of the Native American, but but mostly African American, young, uh, not young man, he's, he's my age. Um, he said that an analogy that he uses is that the, 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 uh, the privileged world, the privileged classes, have been eating these gorgeous, juicy apples and then throwing the cores. And people on the margins have been forced to sustain themselves simply by eating the cores. And with the hope that eventually they'd get to eat the apples too, and how bittersweet or just bitter it is to finally get to the place where you think that and you realize that the apples are bad. Not only that, the tree is dying. Uh, and it's an emotionally excruciating place to be. And yet that is the reality that we find ourselves in. So to the degree that somebody who has been oppressed or discriminated or marginalized um, uh, can not fall victim to bitterness and resentfulness, it's not easy, but I think the quality of their own remaining days, weeks, months, and years, if they're graced to have that long, will be significantly enhanced by that generosity of soul. Susan Ward, you had your hand up earlier. I've never heard of this before. I belong to Christians for Climate Action and Just Stop Oil and have been, you know, signed up to get arrested and everything. I'm a grandmother of four beautiful, beautiful children. Um, so I'm, I'm guessing that this is, you know, I, I will obviously look at the TED Talks and everything. And because I'm deducting that you, you think, well, don't give up on all, all that protest stuff, you know. Um, the, the one thing I wanted to say that's kept me going is that that thing um, uh, that Jesus says about um, the meek will inherit the earth. And I think, you know, well, I hope they do, you know, 
the gentle because um, I love 12 step programs um, and they are so gentle. And I believe, you know, 12 step spirituality has got all the answers. And, um, and I hope that the, the gentle will inherit the earth. Thanks. Well, thank you, Susan. And yes, I do more so than my TED Talks. I encourage you, to, once this is up on YouTube, to, to watch this and, and, and the discussion carefully, because I actually, I celebrate a, a 12 step approach to acceptance. I've been a friend of Bill W for 34 years. Um, I think that as Jordan Perry made the case, we're all addicted to civilization. And uh, yeah, I, I, had a, I had a sponsor decades ago say that the 12 steps really boil down to four character traits. That if you follow these quote unquote steps, if you work the steps, you basically grow in four essential areas that every spirituality, every recovery, every program of human betterment in history and any tradition, any continent has these four. The first is humility rather than hubris. The sense that trusting some larger reality, call it God, call it the universe, call it your higher power, whatever, but trusting this biophysical creator, sustainer, and end, and, 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 and having that humility and that trust. That's what the first steps are about. The second one is tell the truth, like stop lying. So humility, authenticity. Like, you know, I consider an addiction anything that leads you to be inauthentic. Anything that you find pleasure or benefit in that you find so much pleasure or benefit in or that you may want it enough that it would be judged by others. And so it leads you to be inauthentic or to give a head fake, like you give the impression that this is true, but this is actually true or lying or whatever. So humility, authenticity, which is the next three steps responsibility we've all left awake we've all harmed people betrayed people hurt people you know alienated people and so to begin to make amends to begin to repair that and in some cases for example in my case there was as i did that work there were two people that all i could say was i don't expect you to forgive me i just want you to know that i know what a shit i was and if I could go back and do it again differently, I would absolutely do it differently. And then in both those situations, tears were the result. And so humility, authenticity, responsibility, stop playing the blame game and start fixing, you know, it's, it's the work of redemption to use religious language. And then finally, service, serve something larger than yourself. And so those four, humility, authenticity, responsibility, and service, are at the heart of every program of human betterment and spirituality and recovery. And that's really where the 12 steps get people to. So thank you for that. Thank you so much. <laughs> that's great. Thank you. Derek Paul, did you want to get into this? Well, I, I don't mind, uh, but it's a risk because I, I've been delighted in what I've heard today. And I see uh, before me an invited guest who clearly has a mission. Uh, I also have a mission and it's beginning to look more like his every day, but uh, my mission includes um, looking at what you know, uh, tr um, transmitting this knowledge. And if you see something very good that should be done to let people know that it should be done and try to get it done. And uh, I'm wondering if uh, our guest thinks that that's a waste of time because to me, it's essential. I do not think it's a waste of time. In fact, I think it's essential. Exactly. Yes, I'm trying to get people to have an ecological understanding of history and human nature so that they can move beyond confusion to clarity, like, oh, of course, of course, of course. When Donald Trump won the election here in 2016, I wasn't pulling my hair out. I said, oh, of course, of course, of course, this is the way. And the same thing with the corruption that we're seeing all over the left, the right. I mean, it's like, I understand how 
corruption and insanity occur. And so, yes, I'm evangelistic about helping people to have an ecological understanding of history and human nature and to follow with as much joy and passion and commitment and generosity as possible everything that you just articulated. And so that, that as I said before, just because we can't save everything doesn't mean there's not a tremendous amount of things that we can do. And that's why I recommended Jordan Perry's, my conversation with him on post-doom actions. Because, I mean, even climate activism, I, I defined, I, I mean, in the bio, I think I, I mentioned Connie Barlow, my wife, as a fellow climate activist. And her first response was, I'm not a climate activist. And I said, well, what do you think assisting the migration of trees is? She said, oh. And I reminded her that there's a profound difference between climate activism that's solidly still in doom yeah. and post-doom climate activism. Post-doom, what I call love and action. And so, yeah. yes. Anything that you see can benefit personal wholeness, social coherence, and ecological integrity is holy, holy work to do. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Uh, thank you for your question. And now, Jean, uh, you have the floor. Thank you, Claude. Um, as chairman of the Canadian Association for the Club of Rome, it's my pleasure and privilege to thank you, Michael on behalf of KCOR for this absolutely uh, wonderful presentation that you've given. You have given us a lot of food for thought, and it certainly is evident by the uh, level of discussion and debate. I'll choose so to I'm... interpret that positively. <laughs> yes, very much yes. so, very much so. Uh, you, you've got a lot of people here today. We have put up a slide here that will show you, we would like you to go to the Canadian uh, Association website, canadiancore.com. If you want to see any of our other presentations, you will be able to do that by going onto our website, uh, sign up for Stay Informed, and when you get that, you will be given the link to this particular talk and the ability to see any of the other presentations that we have had in the past three years during COVID. If you're interested in becoming a member of KCOR, you are able to find that information on our website, as well as if you are interested in donating to support our cause to keep this kind of information going, you can do that on our KCOR website as well. So I would like to thank you again very much for coming on to this uh, presentation today, and I look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you.